Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Jennifer Chung. I have many, many hats, and this hat I have on for today is the moderator for this session. And this is the session uh, for the Dynamic Coalition on Environment. We're really happy to have a really a uh, full agenda for you. We have community presentations. We have a, an address from our co-chair, Rainier Crook. And we also have Florina, who was the lead for the Policy Network on Environment, uh, give us a little bit more of the history of the Policy in, uh, Network and then the subsequent uh, uh, transition of this work into the Dynamic Coalition. And after all of the presentations from the community members, we will have some uh, feedback as well as impressions from other dynamic coalitions uh, on what they uh, are looking at, their work in conjunction with our work at the Dynamic Coalition on uh, Environment. And then finally, we'll have an open floor where, um, of course, members uh, uh, of the floor and also online will be able to, to ask us any questions, any comments, any, you know, suggestions and concerns you have for the work uh, uh, that the dyna Dynamic Coalition is doing. I am suddenly not in Zoom anymore. I will assume that everybody else is still in Zoom, that somehow I have dropped, but that doesn't matter. I would like to actually give the floor right now to Florina Waspi. She is the policy lead on the policy <coughs> network on environments before. Um, Florina, if you would like to take the floor to give us a little bit of background on the policy network and, and its work and the subsequent, I guess, transition to the DC. Florina, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Super, great. So I'll quickly share my screen if that's okay. I have a little presentation that I would like to share with you. So let me just set this up. And yeah, so hi, everyone. Nice to meet you, see some of you again. Um, so I was invited just to give a little bit of a um, background or a little bit of some information about what happened with the P and E in 2021. Um, so last year, so I'm happy to do that and answer any questions you might have. I don't want to take too long because I think you've had to have a full session uh, that will, will take place. But so the policy network um, was founded in 2021 or actually 2020, um, following the first uh, environmental session or session about the environment at the IGF in 2020. And um, because there were just people or there was this um, feeling that this topic was uh, interesting to many people and so that there it would be a good idea to start a policy network to connect people to have a concrete output to to go on and so the plan was this so as you see with this visual so the idea was to have a policy network which should fulfill um, several functions one of them the main one that I'm going to talk about is this report so we had a concrete goal starting uh, going into this mandate that I had for the PNE uh, for the IGF last year. I started this in, I believe, March or April. So that's when we got kind of the first group together. It started out with a group of experts and a bit of a loose network already that was alerted to this policy network and invited to join the work on the report. And the beginning or from the beginning, the idea of this report was to formulate concrete actionable policy recommendations on how we could achieve some kind of global action um, in this kind of intersection between environment and digitalization. So the idea of sustainable digitalization, how can we get there? What do we have to do? And what are the different aspects of this topic? So it's kind of laid the groundwork. Um, this is a bit of an overview of what happened with the PE. So we've had over 65 meetings, so quite a lot in 2021. Obviously, almost all of them were online via, via Zoom. We've had participants from Germany, Switzerland, like Europe, but also Asia, Australia, New Zealand. So we've had to handle, juggle the time zones as well, as I'm sure all of the IGF participants know from their, from their own projects. So that was quite interesting. We've had 87 individual participants who participated in any of the events that we've had and we have uh, almost 28 words uh, 28,000 words written in this report and we've also had several interesting guest speakers uh, during our p &E meetings and quite a good gender balance for the kind of technological topics where sometimes we see a bit of a um, 
yeah, there's some more male presence, but I believe we've had quite a good gender balance. And really, honestly, from my part, it was a great experience. I've We've had a really good community built up during this time. It was very interesting, all of the, the work that we did together. And I'm really happy to have been part of this, uh, even though it was a limited contract. So I, I get to this point a bit in the end of my presentation also. But so uh, if you want to check up on the report, I've linked this here. I, I'm also happy to share the slides with you later with the chair so you may distribute it. And um, so here's the link to the policy network site where you can read up on what we did. There's also uh, the links to all of the presentations and the uh, scripts, transcripts of the of the meetings, as well as of course the final PE uh, report, uh, which I which I will show you in a minute. So this is the overview of the report that we've uh, in the end drafted or published. So we've decided together with the group that we're we're going to focus on different thematic chapters. Obviously, um, there would have been could have been many others or different titled chapters because the, the topic is so huge, so large. But we've chosen to focus on them also based on the interests of the members that were a part of the P and E. Um, so this is the final report. This is our uh, lovely. Um, uh, yeah, um, title page. I've linked it again. It's open uh, for you to check out, to read, and uh, all of the all of the recommendations that we formulated. So just to, I won't present all of the recommendations because I think that will be too long, and you're happy to check it out or ask questions. But just a couple of them. Um, but first, just to make it clear, like we were really focusing our recommendations on environmental sustainability. So we have these two axes of how can we use ICT for sustainability and how sustainable is ICT itself, so the sustainability of the ICTs. And obviously, when we talk about in sustainability, sustainability is much larger than just environmental sustainability, but we've had limited resources and we really wanted to make a point. So we chose to kind of focus our work on the environmental sustainability side, but obviously social and economic also play a huge part and when we discuss uh, ICTs and environment. So where do our recommendations situate or how can you understand them when you read them? So it's important to kind of understand what we focused really at the high level recommendation level. So when you think about a policy recommendation, it, there are different elements to a policy. So there's like the action, the instrument, who's the target of it, who's the policy owner, so who's responsible of carrying out the recommendation. But we've really focused on the objective of the policy. So what does the policy aim to do? What do we suggest to reduce, prevent, encourage? strengthen, etc. So that's really where our uh, recommendations are focused or situated at. And that's also something I think would be interesting to pursue now to like start from these recommendations or add to them and really think about what's the action that we want to take, what's the specific instruments that we could uh, propose or introduce and who's the actual, who should be responsible or who could we call upon to, to carry out these policy recommendations. Because that's, like I said, it's some groundwork. So we really started high level with this. So here's the overview of the recommendations. Um, I won't go, like I said, into detail with all of them, just mention these, this one um, chapter. So we, I, I don't think I've mentioned this, but the way we worked in the p &E was we've worked in, we had work groups established that were focusing on these different topics. So for example, we had a work group on food and water systems and how this is related to ICT and sustainability. And these were the three recommendations that they came up with after these five months. So so first of all, um, I think what is really interesting or nice or also illustrative of how the IGF works is this sensitivity or to local context to, like they said, the first one that we really want to stress is that it should be uh, applied, like digitalization in food systems should be really applied with contextual specificity and sensitivity. So really take into account the local context, not just push digital measures. Uh, but they also said we should increase our capacities for the use of space derived earth science data. So really, um, we've had a, a group only focused on environmental data, but obviously environmental data permeates throughout all of the different topics. It's a huge, important topic. Um, but so this also is uh, found again here. So uh, the group thought it was really important to stress this point of the space derived earth science data. And maybe also if you think of Elon Musk or other private individuals who harvest these data or who have satellites, I think that's an important for me, interesting topic to discuss maybe in a forum like this as well. How can we kind of 
democratize or make give access to to researchers to the bigger public to these kind of space data um, and finally the third recommendations of a recommendation of this group was to prepare national and regional plans and strategies to optimize the water system so especially with a focus on developing countries so that's just to give you a, a bit of a quick overview of how these exam how these recommendations look like and as i said you're very welcome to check out the other recommendations uh, in the report that is linked on the pne website yeah and so finally i want to say some words about kind of what happened next since we are here now one year later basically oh, wow. <laughs> i think someone has just the microphone open it's not a question or is it no, I don't think so. Okay, so come on, feel free. I don't see all of if anyone raises a hand, feel free. But otherwise, what I wanted to say just to, to finish this presentation is after I have so basically my contract was a limited con a limited one. So I only had I was only contracted until December, so until right the end of, of the IGF. So what, what happened is obviously we have produced this report of which I'm really, uh, with which I'm really happy and I'm really proud of it and the work we did with this huge group you'll see um, when you look at the report we've had almost 40 uh, co-authors so it was really really a great pleasure but it was a bit disappointing for me because as I said I think that's probably part of also how the IGF has worked so far that because it kind of this contractual work and this kind of very dynamic and there's different waves of work. It was a bit difficult for me to actually disseminate this report because my work had ended officially and I have had to move on to other uh, or have another uh, main job as a researcher. So um, I have tr presented the report, for example, at Arab IGF and Eurodic this year. And I've had really a lot of interesting discussions also on in the Swiss context with uh, colleagues, with um, other international colleagues. But it's been really difficult to have a concrete follow up. But there was no concrete follow up because there were no really Really resources allotted uh, to this contract-based assignment that I had that were intended for follow-up and for actual communication outreach after the end of this, of this contract. So that's really something I'm interested in or hoping that maybe this has developed. I know that now it has turned into a DC, so uh, the Dynamic Coalition might be able to have more resources to follow up on this because for me it was a bit of a, a shame that so much work went into this, re into this report, but there were no really resources there to actually follow up on the report and um, so yeah that but i mean it's there the report is there to share it's there to work and build up on it so yeah i'm really uh, optimistic and i'm hoping that this will contribute to the great work i'm sure the dc will be doing in the future yeah as i said that was it um feel free to ask or ask any questions you might have also uh, you can reach out to me via email yes thanks again to all the co-authors some of them maybe are here today. It really was a big pleasure. Uh, of course, Reiner also, and feel free to contact me at my uh, work email uh, at BFH, so the university in Bern where I'm working at. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Florina, for that presentation. I guess the first question I have for you, is it possible for you to drop the link to the report that is so uh, so yes. fulsome to the to the chat so the you know the Zoom participants and all the rest of the participants are able to take a look at this incredible report. Um, I also wanted to see if there's any questions so far for Florina from the floor or in the Zoom room. Not quite yet. I think people are getting a little warmed up. So in that case, I think I would like to pass the floor over to the co-chair of the Dynamic Coalition. Rainier Crook is joining us online, and he'll be able to give us some context on how the Dynamic Coalition has taken up this great work from the Policy Network and what the vision and mission are for the, uh, for the Dynamic Coalition going forward. Um, Rainier, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Um, I'll essentially pick up where Florina just finished, and I think she gave a brilliant overview of the work of, in the PNE and the resulting product. And, oops, started with the last slide. I don't want to start at the end. Okay, that looks better. Um, so... I'm going to talk about how the Dynamic Coalition on the Environment actually was formed and 
It actually started with the PNE. The PNE created a great report and Florina outlined it, as I already mentioned, quite nicely. And there were many, many good discussions happening during the writing of the report, which actually couldn't get into the report because it was too much limited in space and time. So we decided shortly after the uh, PNE report was released, really, it should the work should continue. It should, and uh, the idea came up that a dynamic coalition could be formed, and that happened quite quickly after that. And the DCE was formed. There was some collection of ideas what the DCE could do, but in general, the idea was that the basis is the PE report. The PE report gives guidelines, gives information on what can be done, what should be done. But Renier, I think you might have muted yourself. We can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry. Press the wrong key. Wasn't the way that I can mute with one button key. Um, so we wanted to go beyond the PE report. And the focus of the DCE obviously is on the environment and on the interaction of environment with internet governance. So we didn't do that much in the last year. So we don't have any real products which we can show because there was lots of discussion going on in which direction we want to move, how we want to form ourselves. And so the main things which came up in the last year, but I think which are essential really to go forward with the DCE to be really efficient in the work is that we decided on the structure and some vision and mission for the DCE. Really, we should work along. Uh, looking at the structure of the DCE. The DCE has quite strong two faces. The one is on the side of the EGF, and the second side is in your environmental sector. I'm coming from the environmental sector, and I wasn't that much aware. Essentially, I was not aware at all of the IGF and the work of the IGF before I was drawn into the PNE. So you really have these two distinct sides which the DCE should address or should include. To reflect these two sides of the same coin, of the same story, we decided to have two chairs, two co-chairs of the Dynamic Coalition, where one comes from the IGF side, has experience on the IGF side, the one is My Michael Oguia, and the other one is coming from the environmental side, so that we really have even in the that structure embedded the interests or the missing knowledge about IGF from the environmental side and the inner workings of the IGF. Um, last but not least, we had extremely valuable support from the IGF secretariat in the form of Anya Genko. Um, all the organizational issues, they helped extremely and I would say sometimes to push us to do something after we were sitting at home and contemplating and thinking too much about this whole issue, to really move forward with meetings and decisions. Um, some info on the background of the two co-chairs. Michael, I'm sure most of you know, um, he has a long experience in the IGF DCs. He worked on sustainable infrastructure since 2017. He calls himself an ICT sustainability advocate, and uh, he definitely is one. 
he, and he has a decade of professional experience in conflict resolution, journalism, media, policy and development. He is really at home in the IGF infrastructure. He knows many people there. He knows the inner workings. And he is extremely interested in sustainability. On the other hand, that's myself. I have a background in biodiversity. I'm active in IPBES, in the task force on knowledge and data, focusing on data management, free data, fair data, care data. And through that activity, became quite interested in indigenous and local knowledge. And these two backgrounds supplement each other very nicely in our work towards bringing the DCE forward and developing the vision, which I will present now. The first thing which the DCE wants to do is engagement of the environmental sector and internet governance and policy related discussions and processes. There is definitely already going on a lot, but it is coming mainly coming from the IGF side and not that much from the environmental side because the environmental side is not aware of it. So we are talking about an increase of that already existing engagement. And the aim of that whole activities are to efficiently address environmental concerns and questions. And the framework which this will be done in is in a sustainable, fair and open, successful and inclusive development of the internet. So putting these things together and putting some words in there to read nicely, the vision of the DCE is to increase the engagement of the environmental sector in internet governance and policy related discussions and processes to more efficiently address environmental concerns and questions essential for the sustainable, fair, open, successful and inclusive development of the internet. This resulted in a mission, which I'm just going to read, uh, to be the forum to ensure the environmental perspective is included in the key debates around all internet governance related questions. And the very diverse environmental community, and that's an important point, the environmental community is not a homogeneous community, it is extremely heterogeneous community, ranging from climate, biodiversity, different regions, different focus, different scales, uh, providing an entrance point for stakeholders with an environmental perspective to contribute to the IGTF on public policy and governance issues. And overall, the aim is to facilitate research in the inter interface of IGF and environmentalment in initiated by IGF members as well as environmental players. There are many things going on from the IGF side initiated, but not many by the environmental players. So the values of the DCE, the framework in which it will be working on is essentially based on the fair data principles, which are focusing on data sharing, data accessibility, data reusability, and the care principles for indigenous data governance with in the respect of collective benefits aspects like these. They are playing an essential role and they are nicely encapsulated also in the UNESCO recommendations on open science. These three documents form the base, the guidelines of the DCE, how the work is done and which is included in the work. Coming to the nitty gritty stuff, to activities which we are planning. First one is outreach to environmental community in fora events such as sessions and workshops and scientific conferences, really to go out, say, hi, we are here. I'm sure you have questions. We can help. We can work together to address questions. 
another option are side events at UN conferences, for example, at the COP, which is happening now in uh, Montreal. Then environmental key organizations like IPES or IPCC in the DSE, bringing their voices in. And last but not least, an activity which is cross-sectoral UN report writing, writing reports together with UN organizations. Um, the second main area is form cross-cutting interest groups throughout other DCs to assess DC overarching environmental issues. Then organizing events, issues oriented workshops, etc., in collaboration with other internet ICT environment governance related organizations. And the last one is really focusing on own work that one specific topic is uh, chosen for each year and then a yearly issue report about a specific issue relating to the environment is uh, written, developed together with players from the environmental side and from the internet governance side, really to come up with over the years with a set of specific topics addressed in these reports, which give an overall overview over this topic. That's all which I want to talk about. I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reina. Um, are there any questions for our co-chair, Reina, from the floor or in the Zoom room? I'll pause a little bit. Uh, I guess maybe just a little bit of reflection from, from myself as well. I mean, I am guilty of not really being so involved with the work of this DC, but uh, it seems to me that the diversity, especially from the environmental sector, is is actually extremely a, a very strong point for the IGF and the IG community to continue to create more connections and more uh, I guess uh, sharing of information data as what uh, Rainer has said and to be able to outreach to both different communities so that we can learn from each other that this work is not siloed. So this is a very important point I wanted to bring up from what Rainer has mentioned. Now I think I'd like to bring us to the second segment of our session. And this is a segment where we have the community presentations. I'm very happy to pass the floor to our very first presentation uh, from Reina Otsuka. She is the UNDP's uh, Digital Innovation Lead for Nature and Climate Energy. Reina, the floor is yours. If you can give Reina, yes, she is able to screen share. Yes. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning, everybody, and um, also good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if you're online. Um, I would like to present uh, a coalition for environment, uh, sorry, coalition for digital environmental sustainability. And I am from UNDP, but today I'm trying to represent the co-champions that are uh, organizing this coalition. So I, I guess uh, Rainer and uh, really, uh, outlined it very well, but basically there's two different dynamics going on in the world right now. One is the digitalization, where we actually have, um, well, one is digitalization, and the second one is climate change, uh, nature degradation, and pollution, which are called the triple planetary crisis. And by intertwining these two, the world can go into two very different directions. COES was uh, born as a response to two blind spots in the SDGs, uh, as well as for the roadmap for digital environmental cooperation. So um, we noticed that actually in the digital cooperation roadmap, there was no environmental roundtable uh, when it started. So um, all of us, the co-champions, including UNEP, uh, UNDP, together with Germany, Kenya, the International Science Council, as well as Future Earth, uh, it's, you can see it's a mixture of different organizations from UN you know, governments and uh, international society. And so we, we got together and started this coalition. We recently um, actually published the action plan for a sustainable planet in the digital age at the Stockholm Plus 50 International Conference. And I'd like to walk you through a little bit about how we framed the intertwined um, area of digital.
digital and environment, which I think really correlates with uh, what, what uh, was just presented in, uh, today. Uh, this was the process we took. Um, it started, we, well, code started in March 2021. Uh, we actually had a lot of roundtables um, around the digital cooperation roadmap, uh, as well as um, major events such as the United Nations Environmental Assembly uh, and a codes uh, directed events as well. So the framework that we are proposing is to really move together as a global community toward the The three systemic shifts. Uh, the first is to align uh, digitalization with sustainable development. We really feel that the alignment between the digital and environmental sustainability is still lacking. And I'm really glad that the DCE is happening um, that in, in that sense. The second part that we think is really important is to mitigate the negative impacts of um, digitalization. We are aware that the ICT sector is, you know, it's really increasing in the energy use as well as uh, carbon emission. So how can we make sure that uh, we mitigate this negative impact is the second area that we, we really want to propose. The third, we really want to make sure digital innovation helps to accelerate our sustainability goals, uh, especially in the environmental field, including climate change change, adaptation, mitigation, environmental management, uh, waste management. In all of these fields, digitalization has a very important role to play. And in order to do this, uh, we are proposing nine impact initiatives so that it doesn't become just a, you know, a, an agenda setting, but we really want to make sure that things start to take action. Uh, the nine impact in initiatives, I won't go into detail because we don't have time today, uh, but we do have a session at 3 p.m. today. Uh, if anybody's interested, it's actually on the uh, basement floor, should we say, on the ground floor uh, in the, the press conference room. So we'll, we'd love to talk with you um, there as well. But basically, you can see that we have three initiatives in each of the three shifts that we think will really help catalyze the changes that we're trying to go for. As codes, we have a few other um, milestones lined up in the future. Uh, so there will be a summit for the future. Uh, it was planned in 2023, but it's going to be in 2024, we heard. Uh, and then there's another UNEA uh, in 2024. So the next milestone will be in 2024. And how you can join CODES, um, we do have a, a community called the CODES uh, Spark Blue, uh, which is basically where we run a lot of online consultations and anybody can join and um, submit their views. So please do join the community. Uh, you can also engage with us directly in the roundtables. Uh, you can also choose to co-lead one of these impact initiatives uh, together with other organizations. And of course, we're always happy if you can advocate for codes and the three shifts that we are presenting. And maybe a call out to the IGF and to the DCE. We do have a stakeholder mapping going on, and it will be great if you can also submit uh, IGF and all the activities in the mapping tool that we have, uh, so that then we can start to connect you with other stakeholders that are in the codes community. Yep, I guess that's about it. I'll be here. Um, if you have any questions on codes, uh, we'll be happy to take those as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rena. I guess the first thing I wanted to make sure is that people know what time the, the afternoon session might be. So if they're interested to join CODES. So sure, I'll... thank you. It's at 3 o'clock, 3 to 4 p.m. Um, again, at the press conference or press <laughs> briefing room downstairs. Excellent. Um, I think, I guess, one of the things that you already suggested that the D DCE might be able to take up is to submit, you know, IGF and its works and, uh, uh, on the environment to, to the stakeholder mapping. I think that's very important for us to make sure we are, you know, aligned and also communicating on the works that we're doing. Um, any questions from the floor right now for Reina or in the room? Okay, if not, we do have a larger, uh, I guess, Q&A session at the end of the segment and now I'd like to pass the floor over to our second presenter um, he's Dino Cataldo del Asio I'm sorry if I messed up your name he is the chief information officer at the UN joint staff pension fund Dino the floor is yours thank you, thank you very much uh, I'm pleased to share with this forum um, an experience 
of the United Nations Pension Fund as an example of a, a sustainable solution. I introduced this concept yesterday afternoon during the panel on open forum. Um, I hope this can serve as an example of the United Nations uh, practicing what is preaching. That's exactly what was my introduction yesterday. So I will illustrate how we went about this solution and uh, what are the elements that uh, supports this solution as an environmentally sustainable solution. So here I'm sharing with you the, um, I hope that you can see the screen, the slides. Yeah, perfect. So this is the actual uh, presentation on the internet website of the UN Joint Staff Pension Fund in January 2021, when we went live with the deployment of this application. Fundamentally, it's a system that makes use of an app on devices that can be uh, used by anybody around the world. And it's called Digital Certificate of, the, of the Entitlement. It's a digital identity solution that the pension fund developed for its retirees and beneficiary. And as you will see um, in the details of the following slides, we're talking about a population of over 84,000 individuals residing in more than 190 countries around the world. So first and foremost, as already uh, referenced by my uh, esteemed colleagues in the panel, uh, of course, in developing the solution, we made sure to be aligned with the SDG. In particular, the 16.9, which is about digital identity, and the 17.8, which is about ICT, sustainable ICT. We are also very pleased to be the recipient of the United Nations Secretary General Award on Innovation and Sustainability for 2021 as a result of the successful implementation of the solution. We also uh, wanted to make sure that in uh, deploying this solution, we were also going to provide assurance to our users, to our client. As you can appreciate and as you will see in the following slides, this solution makes use of new technologies, in particular biometrics, specifically facial recognition and blockchain. And therefore, as you can appreciate, many users were relatively skeptical at the beginning in embracing a technology that required them to capture their own biometrics data. So one of my primary concern, also because my background is in IT auditing, was to find a way to provide assurance. And this is also a theme that has been addressed and I believe it's an item for discussion in other fora. There is unfortunately not much of a standard for uh, providing assurance on new technology, specifically biometric and, uh, and blockchain. Nonetheless, there is something already in place, such as the ISO 27001 Standard Information Security Management System. And for lack of better tools, this is the one that I use to certify the solution. And indeed, this is actually a screenshot of the certificate that we received upon a successful completion of the audit. So what was the problem that we tried to address? The problem was defined into four elements. First and foremost, to provide a mean for identity authentication to our user. Second of all, allow them to prove that they are alive, proof of existence. Third, proof of transaction. And fourth, proof of location. This was a problem because for 70 years, the beneficiary, the 84,000 beneficiary retirees of the pension fund are where required and are required to confirm that they are still alive at least once a year in order to continue receiving the benefit of the UN Pension Fund. And for 70 years, this process has been handled with a paper-based form that was mailed once a year by the United Nations to the 84,000 individuals in 193 countries and by them signed and returned. 
as we can appreciate, this was often the source of many problems related to the fact that this form was not received or related to the fact that it was received with the substantial delays. And when those delays or the no receipt occurred, the pension fund was forced to suspend the payment. In addition to this, the pension fund has always been questioned by governing body, by oversight bodies, by stakeholders as to whether we could attest that there was no fraud. Because as you can appreciate, again, talking about a paper-based form with a signature is relatively easy to forge, but proving a negative is impossible. And therefore, hence here, the adoption of biometric and facial recognition to prove instead a positive evidence and confirmation that uh, someone indeed is still alive. So from a manual snail mail, as we often mention, paper-based form, a certificate, to a biometric-based solution, which use a mobile application, blockchain to create an immutable record and registry, and also GPS technology, because in certain cases for the pension fund, it's important to also know the specific location of the user vis-a-vis -vis certain payment that are provided in local currencies. So what did we use? We used blockchain to provide a proof of identity and transaction by creating an immutable, independent, auditable, and traceable triple entry distributed ledger. Specifically speaking, we use a solution provided by Hyperledger, the Hyperledger Indy. Second of all, we use biometrics to provide proof of identity and proof of existence by using facial recognition, which, however, and this is definitely an important element to emphasize, it's stored only on the device of the user. It's never transferred and is never transmitted to the server of the organization in order to authenticate user. And the events, the enrollment and the certification are recorded on the blockchain. Then there is the global positioning system that as alluded to before, it's used only in certain cases where also the location, it's an important element to take into account for the process itself. So coming to the environmentally fr uh, friendly aspect of the application, I highlighted in yellow on the top and the bottom of this slide. We are dealing with 84,000 beneficiary. We are dealing with beneficiary that have resigned in more than 195 countries. So the immediate benefit of using this application was that we were able to achieve savings in energy, in materials, and in transportation. For example, we are no longer using paper. We are, no longer, we are no longer printing forms. We are now mailing this form through 195, 193 postal service two times because there was the sending of the form by the UN and then the return of the signed form by the user to the UN. We are no longer conducting signature verification once the form was received. And here I apologize for the acronym and the technical reference. We are now using proof of work, which is a known consensus mechanism, for example, of permissionless blockchain such as Bitcoin. And that it's very well known to use a lot of energy. So unfortunately, for those who are not very familiar with this technology, when the term blockchain is heard, it's often associated with Bitcoin. So I always try to make a point in clarifying that we are now using the same type of technology used by Bitcoin, but a different time, which is permission-based and does not use this highly um, energy consumption technology. And finally, also we're no longer using paper archiving because everything is digitalized and stored in our server. So this is, in, in a nutshell, the main element of the solution, the aspect of the solution, and I believe an example of how the UN itself can contribute within its own internal processes in meeting many of the principles that are stated in its policies and procedure. Thank you. Thank you very much.
you know, it's a very elegant case study, actually, of uh, this problem and the solution. And it's actually uh, extremely important to understand even such a simple problem will have such a big impact on the environment and the solution itself is, is extremely elegant as you have presented. Thank you so much, Dino. Um, I would like now to pass the floor to our third community uh, presentation. His name is uh, YZ Yao. He is the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Information uh, Technology and Development. YZ, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair, Moderator. Uh, as she has introduced me, I work to the Center for Information Technology and Development, uh, an affiliate of the Association for Progressive um, Communications, APC. So I'm going to speak on behalf of the Environmental Sustainability Group of the APC and uh, merely to uh, discuss some of the work that the uh, group uh, has been doing over the last two years. Uh, my colleague, uh, Mike Jason, who is uh, participating online, uh, would fill in the gap. I would focus more on the African aspect of the work, and uh, he would uh, speak on the global dimension of the work we do. Uh, just to provide a background on how we come into uh, the intersection of the digitization and um, um, environment. Um, the African continent is uh, virtually an ICT consumption um, uh, continent. In other words, that um, we do very little of a production of uh, ICT uh, products and uh, devices. So much of what we get uh, imported. Um, because of that, uh, devices often are more costly uh, in the African continent than in other parts of the world. And that's mean that affordability uh, tends to be quite uh, low uh, within uh, the continent. And so in response to the growing demand for uh, digitization and uh, access to digital devices, uh, many African countries have responded to this gap through the importation of not just uh, uh, new products, but also uh, uh, second-hand uh, ICT uh, devices. Uh, some of these which have uh, nearly reached the end of this uh, life uh, span. And what that means to the country is that um, uh, within a few months or years of this arrival, uh, they become part of a growing legion of uh, e-waste uh, in the continent. Um, so that's one aspect of the problem, that uh, across African countries, uh, you are building uh, an ocean of uh, uh, huge waste. Um, and therefore, there's a challenge of how do you manage uh, this waste. Uh, the second challenge is that, uh, again, Africa is an uh, energy challenge. Um, and of course, we know that uh, ICT require uh, energy to, to be useful uh, in the society. And so there is, uh, how do you ensure that uh, there is clean energy um, uh, across the continent uh, for effective use of ICT? Much of the use, I mean, the energy available is uh, fuel based, uh, which pollutes the environment, and uh, which also further through the extractive nature of fuel, uh, constitutes a challenge to environmental uh, sustainability. And so uh, when the uh, APC uh, uh, decided to constitute a team, uh, these are some of the challenges that um, it um, uh, gave to the group to look at. 
And so over the years, uh, some of the uh, key engagements um, uh, in this area uh, include uh, first of all, uh, undertaking the research to understand the nature, the extent of the uh, uh, e-waste. Uh, and distribution across also the layers uh, uh, about the, uh, but also that research also includes uh, exploring the opportunities for uh, repair and uh, as part of major contributions to seeding and building um, the circular economy in the ICT uh, sector. And uh, one particular uh, uh, projects or uh, work that has been done is within the Nigeria where there has been extensive work in terms of uh, repair of uh, handsets uh, uh, and today the skills has uh, been fairly democratized within the country that uh, you know although Nigeria does not produce uh, uh, handsets uh, any type of handset can be repaired uh, within uh, that country. And that serves to uh, extend the lifespan of those um, equipment and therefore reduce the rate at which e-waste um, is uh, piling up uh, in the environment, which constitutes not only health hazards to the citizens, but also uh, distort and uh, 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 the environment um, uh, itself. Uh, the second strand of the work is actually building uh, capacity across the continent on uh, repair and reuse, and not just of handset, but also of other strands of ICT devices, so that, um, again, because the major sources of these um, uh, devices are second hand, uh, the idea is that, that through uh, repair and reuse means you'll be extending the lifespan of those uh, uh, facilities. Uh, the third area is in terms of uh, building capacity for uh, managing e-waste within the continent. And that's not only to ordinary citizens, but also to government agencies who have responsibility for uh, oversight and for monitoring and uh, um, taking action uh, in terms of addressing um, uh, uh, e-waste uh, in the country. And uh, to be able to, to do that, uh, we also need to uh, generate data in terms of uh, doing research around the uh, types of policies that uh, can be articulated and implemented in terms of managing uh, uh, e-waste uh, in the a continent. And so another strand of work that we do uh, involves um, uh, advocacy around um, uh, developing and uh, implementing effective policies that would enable state actors to manage uh, e-waste uh, in this respect respective uh, countries. Uh, many of the countries have some uh, policies, but the implementation has always been uh, problematic. Either uh, they are poorly implemented or they are simply uh, not implemented. And then the final aspect is that um, Africa is um, uh, a, a site of a uh, intense extractive work, either it's uh, uh, extracting gold, uh, other minerals, or petroleum. And so that we think that it's important to also hold um, actors in the uh, space, the extractive space, uh, to account not just in terms of what they extract, but in terms of managing the uh, waste that they produce 
and how they are able to uh, remove those waste and make the environment uh, sustainable. And so these are the, some of the strengths of the work that the Environmental Sustainability Group of the APC uh, does within the African continent. And I think that uh, Mark Jackson would probably add on on what he does uh, globally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Wazid. I think we will be hearing from Mike Jensen a little bit later when we're looking at the reactions from the DCs, but if Mike, you would like to take the floor now to give a little bit more of context, um, you are welcome to do so. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, um, thanks, YZ. I think you've actually really uh, summarized uh, APC's work in the area of uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, the African context is really where a lot of our work uh, has been taking place. Um, but, uh, you know, this provides a very uh, good model that, that is also being um, replicated in, in Latin America and Asia where we can. Um, a lot of this has been traditionally around capacity building to create more awareness about the circular economy. Um, and, and then I will touch uh, in my presentation shortly on some of the other aspects uh, that uh, we think are important as well. It actually it focuses very well on our work uh, within the, uh, the other dynamic coalitions. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, so when we go back to the, to the other DCs, we'll hear your presentation as well. I guess now I'll put on the second hat I have for this session. Oh, okay. Uh, and then that is as another presenter for a particular interesting project called Eco Internet. And I'm going to share this very quickly. Okay. So um, in my second hat for this season, uh, this session, I'm actually uh, the director of corporate knowledge for .Asia organization. We are an internet registry, but we are a nonprofit organization where we have a lot of interesting community initiatives and projects. And this is one of it. Um, when the Policy Network on Environment first started uh, back in 20, uh, I think it's 2020 or 2021, I think that was the first year that there was uh, the work on the PNE, um, we looked at specifically to consider what the carbon footprint of the internet is because in 2020, the world kind of went into lockdown, there was a pandemic, everybody started to live their lives online. And of course, the activity... Uh, 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 daily life, social life, work life, everything has turned into the internet, turned to a digital kind of realm. And how has that really impacted? What is the actual carbon footprint of the, the internet? Um, we were very lucky to have a partner with APNIC Foundation, so this, um, and also a very generous grant from HBS, uh, their offices in Hong Kong, to create this pilot initiative and study. This is our little tiger who is actually a mascot and a champion for the sustainable development goals that our own organization uh, does, does work on. And this is a group of advisors and experts that we have consulted because we, uh, we are experts in uh, internet governance, but as Rainer and also uh, Raina <laughs> has mentioned, um, the environment uh, uh, industry, the sector is extremely diverse and the, the expertise is extremely varied. And we were very lucky to receive uh, advisors and uh, expert advice on this particular project. Um, you could see probably, you know, in the past two years when you have these, actually more than the past two years, when you have these headlines in the news, in the media saying, you know, what is the carbon footprint of streaming a video? You're killing X amount of trees when you watch a certain movie. This kind of, kind of sensational clickbait uh, type of headlines makes for good reading, but is this really the actual uh, reality of things? The, the pollution effect on data, of course, it is uh, studied and it is looked at, especially when you're talking about cloud computing and cloud storage. But when you think about the way that we use the internet since the pandemic, especially since that activities that have moved online has replaced more traditional activities of, for example, if I wanted to watch a movie at home, stream it 
on my TV, I can do that in the comfort of my own home. Whereas before, perhaps I would have taken my car, driven myself to a large movie theater, watched there, and, and done that. And the carbon footprint of that compared to you know streaming something on Netflix, that could be an interesting, uh, I guess, lens to look at it. What it replaces, right? So here I'm not really gonna go into too much details on our findings, we actually focused uh, our first pilot project on these six uh, jurisdictions that you've looked at. And you can see uh, gradually through, through the years that there was, of course, a big increase of the hours spent online on this, these uh, six different economies. Um, this in particular is from Hong Kong. This is the usage patterns uh, between 2019 and 2020 when everybody started staying home for much, much longer periods of time. And then here's a small breakdown on the time spent on video, on social media, on music and audio, on gaming and on other things. And then we did a little bit of calculation as well as uh, to the energy consumption per day and the carbon footprint kilowatt um, and then we also did some more calculation total carbon footprints of Hong Kong in specific uh, to do with internet users and internet usage. This I already touched on a little bit uh, in the beginning so I'm not going to really uh, talk about too much but you can see on the screen that you know for the past two and a half years our meetings have been Zoom. You can see all these little screen caps of everyone. And previously, you know, everybody drove their car to the office for these meetings. And looking at the internet footprint versus a physical footprint is also a very interesting way to consider, you know, whether or not the carbon footprint of the internet, the benefits outweigh the negatives. Um, in our pilot study, we looked into three axes. The first one is the economy. So this looks at the internet usage and the digital economy. What that means is uh, the actual internet usage, the carbon footprint of that, as opposed to the benefits that the, each economy received uh, in terms of digital economy output. The second axis we looked at was energy, and this is actually, uh, through our first uh, study, this turned out to be the biggest factor. In each economy, uh, the energy grid and the power grid is the most important. When you're looking at an economy such as India, uh, perhaps the power grid still uses a lot of carbon-based uh, uh, energy, whereas if you look at different uh, countries such as uh, Singapore, their carbon footprint may be different because they use uh, a different type of renewable energy. They do also use natural gases, which is a fossil fuel, but it's interesting to note that a large part of, of this study really depends on the actual power grid and the grid emission factor and the re renewable source of this energy. And then finally, the final axis, the third axis of our, um, our project is to look at the efficiency. And this is probably the most uh, with direct correlation to internet governance. This is to, to talk about the bandwidth and the speed and the peak uh, internet uh, traffic variance. When I, look, when I go through the slides later, we'll look at kind of the peaks and the trials of the internet traffic that goes through the IXPs. And this is very interesting because if we have a very large bandwidth and the peaks and the trials are actually very, very extreme, that really means that we're not really efficiently using uh, the available resources to us. And I really touched on this. I want to fly through here. And um, here you see uh, the grid emission factor comparison of the six economies we looked at. And this really does uh, depend very highly on the power grid of each of the countries. Uh, Australia, of course, a lot of their uh, uh, power comes from a renewable resource. So it is, it is actually looking very interestingly higher there. Whereas when you look at Singapore, it is much lower even though they do use uh, natural gas as a large part of their uh, power grid. Here you can see, if I'm gonna move this a little bit over, uh, the non-renewable versus the renewable resource in the electricity fuel mix. Uh, green, of course, is the renewable part, and then red is, is the non-renewable. And this is in comparison to the uh, grid emission factor that you can see up there. It's interesting to note that China does have a very large, uh, well, compared to the other uh, 
uh, um, uh, jurisdictions you see here, uh, part of the power grid is renewables, and Singapore, as I mentioned, even though they are quite conscious uh, of that, that's because a large part of their power depends on natural gas, that is a non-renewable resource, which is why you can see there, there's a large part of that part is, is shaded in red. Um, earlier when I talked about efficiency, the third axis we looked at is about really the capacity and bandwidth of the internet infrastructure. I think people here are quite familiar already with this map, and this is a map of the undersea submarine cables that go around the world. And it's very interesting to note that when you're looking at uh, that part of the uh, uh, component of this critical axis, when you look at the advantage you receive uh, moving these more traditional, uh, going to the office in person, driving a car, things like a lot of us have done to come to the Internet uh, Governance Forum, what is the advantage to actually turning these activities into, you know, going to do this online? And the advantage really is to look at the uh, economy, the benefits that it brings to each of the jurisdictions. Uh, here's actually a little bit of a graph. I'm sorry, it's a little small there. To look at the peaks and the trials of the internet traffic. Um, when you're talking about uh, efficiency and or efficient use of this, if you see something that is a little bit less up and down, of course, as you see in, in Hong Kong, there's a huge peak and trial. There's a peak time and there's definitely a more downtime there. If we're able to, for example, if there's like uh, mass computing that's needed, mass emails that is needed, uh, data downloads and uploads, if those can be spread out across the hours, this would be a much more efficient use of the networks and a more efficient, uh, I guess, the, um, uh, deliberation and, and distribution of, of the internet traffic. Um, I've touched on these three earlier, and this is just uh, a, a more, I guess, uh, summarized version of what I just explained to everyone. Um, I would like actually to stop sharing and end my presentation with a short video that we did. If I'm able to also share sound. Bear with me. Hopefully this works. Both carbon emission has dropped by percent in 2020 due to COVID lockdown and economic slowdown. But it is expected to bounce back in part due to skyrocketing internet usage. So how does the internet emit carbon? What is the carbon footprint of the internet? Any kind of online activity such as watching videos, playing games, sending emails involves the transfer of data. The internet takes approximately 0.015 kilowatt hour of power to transfer one gigabyte of data. And that does not include the electricity powering the device you are using. However, this carbon footprint is still way less than driving to the cinema to watch a movie or sending a letter for the post office to deliver it. Nevertheless, with the internet usage, we still need to be more carbon conscious about internet usage. One way to improve the eco-friendliness of the internet is to choose to have more renewable energy for the power grid that is powering the internet. To learn more, go to ecointernet.asia. Do more, waste less. And I will stop here with my presentation. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the floor or in room? Oh, I see a hand up already. Um, do we have a roaming mic, maybe? Oh, but we will do, do need to give you a mic because the Zoom room might not be able to hear you. So if you don't mind stating your name and then your question. Hi, uh, so my name is Radhika and I come from India. So uh, the way that we see climate, uh, you know, climate justice with digital rights is no connection at all. They're considered to be like two worlds apart, like in the sky and the land. And I'm just wondering what are the issues that we need to be a little more cautious about as uh, I'm a digital rights activist. As a digital rights activist, uh, what are the things that we need to recognize, you know, at this stage itself? Because uh, while doing our work, we want to be a little more cautious about climate justice. Uh, what uh, we basically, like there was a major uh, 
issue that we saw that happened in India, a climate activist was jailed because uh, I think it was Fridays for Future. She was trying to, uh, there was a Google Doc that she was using and it was termed as a toolkit and the government put her in jail saying that uh, she's, you know, she's uh, just misleading and, and doing all sorts of things on sedition. Uh, so, and, and that's the only like thing that we've seen evolving in the country. But I would really like to understand what are the key issues and the key focuses on, uh, you know, on the relationship between the two that we should be looking at. Should I pass on the mic for another question? Uh, hey, uh, my name is Raul Plummer. Uh, I'm with uh, Electronic Frontier Finland here. And um, um, hearing of all this, um, this talk about getting uh, the internet to become more environmental, um, I think especially the I IGF and the ICANN uh, should be compensating for their carbon footprint. Um, and uh, like we should become carbon neutral um, and, uh, and also our supply chains, uh, the ICANN's and IGF's supply chains should become carbon neutral. Um, also, I'm, uh, I'm a carnivore, uh, but I would actually like to see uh, vegetarian meals here at the IGF. I, I think everybody could, could uh, get by with those um, uh, because mainly because the meat eating has been identified as one of the biggest reasons for the climate change or biggest factors driving it. And um, yeah, I, I really think we have to show example um, as uh, thought leaders uh, and sort of put our um, money where our mouth is. Like, uh, I, I don't want us to remain only uh, theoretical leaders on this and we should really take initiative and and be more practical about it and make our own supply chains environmentally sustainable. Hi, just a short question. Uh, my name is Daniel. I come from Colombia and I found your research on carbon footprint really interesting. I was just wondering um, if you have any thoughts on the environmental impacts of um, constructing and managing data centers near um, water ecosystems. There's a question. There. One more. Two more. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Matthias, uh, working for the UN Office for Design. And, uh, and um, actually, uh, my kind of question goes to, goes to Reina, who spoke about. Um, something related to the subject uh, we, we, we are uh, dealing with. Um, just just a quick question, whether or not you know, disaster risk reduction is also uh, being considered as part of the initiatives that you, you, you highlighted earlier. Also, the speaker that spoke before you, um, Reina, I think, also did mention about the IPCC and climate change. And we cannot separate climate change uh, and then disaster risk reduction. The two are interconnected. So I would, I, would, I would love to hear more about that one. Thank you. Thank you for the four, uh, three questions and a really interesting comment. Um, is there one more question? One more question. Come. Sorry, I am part of the rapporteur, but then uh, I cannot. <laughs> sit down and not participating i have a question especially towards the e-waste management from the africa i would like to understand how, how do you uh, price the situation that uh, maybe there is some social um, aspect when e-waste like is does people understand that, that they are using and is, is that a problem, uh, um, the way you uh, soci socialize the repair and the, re the repair and the reuse uh, mechanism and how do you engage uh, stakeholders, especially the uh, 
maybe the corporate uh, stakeholders uh, that is around in Africa. Thank you. Thank you for this question as well. I think the f there was two questions directed to Reina. If you would like, if you're ready to, to take that first. Sure. Um, on the first question on climate justice, sorry, I might have missed some of the points, um, but perhaps um, to the best of what I can answer now. So for example, in the codes uh, action plan, the second shift talks about um, the unintended consequences of, of digitalization or digital um, technology. And so when we think about, you know, I think what you were mentioning was about climate justice and how um, it's also intertwined with the, the justice of um, the internet justice, I guess. What, so when we think about um, what are the unintended consequences of digital, like it could be something about environment, you know, it, it could be about the environmental impact, but it could also be about inclusivity and making sure that it doesn't exclude uh, people uh, that don't have connection, for example. It could also be about um, we might be unintendedly, um, how should I say, e um, exaggerating behavior, unsustainable behavior by consumers by having, you know, algorithms that try to, to increase a consumption. So we're trying to really look at it in a holistic way. And I would really love you to um, post that into our community as well as, you know, if there are any ways of mitigating things like that happening. So I think my invitation uh, to that com to that question is to really post that as an important question to codes and I, I think people in the community will have um, a lot of views about it so I guess that will be the invitation the second question I think the last question was about disaster risk um, yes so I think I might want to speak to that one more from the UNDP perspective um, because UNDP is the arm in the codes community that really looks at um, this issue of climate change adaptation um, and disaster risk reduction, um, especially in the developing countries. So there are, the digitalization plays a really important role uh, in the climate change adaptation and disaster risk. Uh, for example, it's about early warning systems. Uh, it is about climate risk assessments. Uh, you do need all these new data sources such as satellite imagery or forecasts to, to actually plan uh, and mitigate better uh, the future um, climate-induced disaster. So we really look at uh, digital technologies as an important enabler for this uh, kind of planning. We also do something called the digital readiness assessment for the disaster risk reduction. Uh, this actually looks at everything from uh, you know government government regulation, infrastructure. How are the people's digital literacy? Uh, and so that we try to approach it in a whole of society way. Uh, it's not just about having new technology. It's really about making sure that we build a digital ecosystem in the country so that everybody can benefit from the, the digitalization and, and the connectivity. So I guess, um, you know, the answer is yes, digital technology and digitalization is really an integral part. And it's a very important part, part for a climate change uh, adaptation as well as disaster risk reduction. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. I think there's a few more questions, but I'm also trying to be conscious of the time since we only have 10 more minutes left in the session. Maybe if I can pass the, the answer to uh, the question on e-waste to YZ for a quick response before we go to the DCs. Um, oh, okay, thank you um, very much. Um, what we do is, uh, uh, first of all, build public awareness about um, the e-waste itself, and then they build a, a hierarchy of uh, motives as to how people relate with uh, e-waste, uh, its processing, recycling, and so forth. Uh, so th the first level are those who engage with e-waste at the level of uh, entrepreneurship. That means that you can recycle some of the waste and uh, uh, get some income out of uh, the process. The second hierarchy is to, uh, to deal with a question of health. Um, if you don't deal with e-waste, it can constitute health hazards to you. So if you are not 
won her over on the basis of her entrepreneurship, then hopefully you will be won over on the question of health. And then the third hierarchy, which is more fundamentally for us, is about promoting sustainable digital inclusion, meaning that the, since people need to have those devices, you need to uh, lengthen this on lifespan so that they can uh, be able to afford and therefore in that process increase uh, affordability. Uh, in terms of uh, involving the different stakeholders, yes we do, including the um, uh, corporate organizations but also uh, government agencies. Uh, uh, with respect to uh, corporate organizations, I think some of the key demands that we make on them is uh, to ensure that there are availability, availability of uh, uh, components for replacement and so forth. Because if there are no components, or if they are proprietary, or if uh, uh, actors have a policy that says that you can't uh, uh, put across the component from other manufacturer, then you would have a problem. So we try uh, ensuring that no actor uh, put restrictive uh, policies around the components availability uh, and so forth. But we also uh, begin to advocate about technology design that would uh, uh, take into cognizance the need to lengthen rather than uh, uh, increasingly promoting quick obsolescence because that's what many of the actors are doing just to make sure they have a quick turnover so you produce uh, products whose lifespan is really uh, getting more uh, more lesser than what it's you know so these are some of the thank you thank you I see I'm very conscious of the time I know I was I uh, had two questions directed to me I'm just going to respond very quickly. Uh, the question about whether or not we're looking at uh, data centers and the kind of power that they are using, the electricity consumption they're using, whether or not it's closer to, I think, water source or something. We're going to be looking at that in the second stage of our, our project. We're look, going to be looking at uh, that because in our, um, I guess, research, we looked at the, I guess, the big tech companies, uh, Google, Meta, uh, Microsoft, and their, their pledges to net zero uh, by 2030. And although they, they do pledge that, uh, if you look into it closer, there's a lot of it that's uh, a, very, a lot of nuance into what people would term as greenwashing uh, certain, um, I guess, data and statistics. But we are happy to look forward to that in the second stage of our, our project. And also to the, the online question, I believe there was one directed to Dino, who he will respond online. And then I really want to turn this, uh, um, because they have been waiting so patiently, uh, to Dr. Jajendra um, Gupta uh, to give us a little bit of um, uh, context from the Dynamic Coalition on Internet and Jobs and also the Dynamic Coalition on Digital Health. Maybe uh, two, two minutes from you, Dr. Dr. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, Michael and Renan, for the excellent leadership at the Dynamic Coalition on Environment. So I'm going to talk about the two Dynamic Coalitions we run. One is on digital health and it is expected that health will be one of the biggest contributors to the so-called environmental impact. And uh, we are on internet and jobs where we're looking at leveraging internet for jobs or so connecting almost everyone. But very important point I think that has come out, which we believe is uh, very relevant today, is that digital footprint has a carbon footprint. And I think my colleagues have talked about that. Our lives revolve around internet. Today, it's not a question if I ask you that do you have a mobile phone or do you browse the net? But if I asked you today, like in last one hour, how many of you send an SMS? How many of you used to send an email or to browse the net? Can you raise your hands, please? <laughs> Almost everyone. So let me give you a very factual number, you know, and we're releasing this report uh, day after tomorrow called the Responsible Internet Usage, and probably that's the reason why I'm here. Uh, so for every SMS you sent, it is 0 0.8 grams of carbon emission. For every tweet you did, it is 0 0.2 grams of carbon emission. For every email you send is 0 0.3 to 26 grams of carbon emission. So nothing we do is not denominated by a carbon footprint. And that's why probably deserts are having floods and rain-fed areas are actually facing drought. We are seeing it in every part of the world. Though I would actually uh, say, you know, that uh, some places we keep reading that people are doing intermittent fasting for health. I would sincerely insist that please do internet fasting for planetary health. 
that's very important and we will be releasing this report responsible internet usage and we have a complete uh, detailed session on this on the 2nd of December at the adjoining bank hall from 1045 I'd like you to all join this but one thing I would tell Jennifer and those who work that when we present collective numbers for a country me and my friend representing Africa and India we are at a loss I think we should talk of per capita emissions because that's where we do justice to nations which are still not reached a level of development otherwise you know we are kind of putting wrong denominators at the overall number which don't do justice so I think the key thing is going to be responsibility and let's work towards it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Very, very important reminder, especially when you're looking at per capita. That's very important to look at it in this way. Now I'd like to turn the floor over to Minda Moreira. He, she has been waiting very, very patiently uh, online to give us a, a bit of a uh, view from the um, Internet Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles. Minda, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, and no problem. It has been a great session. Um, and uh, thank you, Dynamic Coalition on Environment, uh, for inviting me to join this very special first meeting. Uh, so I'm here representing the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, and we are delighted to be part of this coalition too, as we believe uh, that it is an essential addition to the IGF intersessional work. Um, so I'll take the next few minutes just to share with you how the RPC has been addressing the issues at the intersection of environment, digital technologies and human rights. Also our commitment to bring these issues to the main agendas of the IGF and why we support and congratulate the efforts to put together this DC. So the RPC is a coalition based here at the IGF that works to make human rights work for the internet. And in 2011, we published the Chart of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet, uh, which is our main outreach document. So it translates its existing human rights law and norms for, to the online environment. Uh, so interestingly, Article 4 of the Charter, the right to development through the Internet, includes a clause on environmental sustainability, and which is now being further developed as a result of the many discussions over the last um, few years. And it was in this context, and by choosing to reflect on issues linked to Article 4, that the coalition started discussing environmental sustainability and was committed to bring what we saw as an important emerging issue to the main agendas of the Internet Governance Forum. So um, our annual meetings between 2018 and 2020 all focused on issues at the intersection of environmental sustainability, ICTs and human rights, and uh, we also organized and participated in many other sessions within the IGF community and beyond. And so very early on, we realized that our discussions resonated deeply with some other members of the IGF community, especially the youth. And we listened to those who have been affected by the harmful consequences of technology on the environment, depletion of natural resources, energy consumption, the increase of e-waste and its devastating consequences for biodiversity and also for the health of entire communities. And uh, we were joined by environmental activists, scientists, members of the technical community, politicians, ICT sector representatives and heard about the major challenges, but also the commitments and the potential of digital technologies to bring about solutions to help us fight the climate crisis and to ensure environmental sustainability uh, and uh, uh, a great and green digital future. Throughout our discussions, we realized that the tools and the know-how to help eliminate the harmful effects of technology on the environment already existed. And we also realized that many of the possible solutions to harness the potential of internet connected technologies to create a green digital transformation were there too. Uh, what was missing was a unifying voice and a joint effort between all stakeholders and communities to develop a concerted strategy and to work uh, together to deliver and achieve visible results. So we believe that the Internet Governance Forum as a multi-stakeholder platform is in a privileged position to bring together these discussions and to create spaces for effective collaboration. And in this context, I think that the um, Dynamic Coalition on Environment is not essential and is also long overdue. Uh, so as a bottom-up multi-stakeholder network, 
the DCE can be the missing link. Uh, it can bridge the IGF community with the wider environmental communities. It can offer a space for dialogue and collaboration on issues at the intersection of um, environmental sustainability, digital technologies and internet governance. And I think that together with other initiatives, such as the Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability, codes that was mentioned here earlier too, the DCE can be a great example of cooperation. So I think there is a lot still to be done and we don't have that much time ahead. And I wish uh, our sister coalition all the best in this important endeavor. And we also look forward to future collaborations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minda. Um, I'd like to now turn the floor over to back over to, to Mike Jensen uh, to hear from the Dynamic Coalition on Community Connectivity. Mike, if I could ask me, maybe if you could uh, limit your intervention to maybe two minutes since we're overrunning a little bit. Thank you, Mike. Your floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks very much for inviting APC to this uh, very important coalition. We, we view this area with a very high priority. Um, APC was actually founded almost 30 years ago by a group of civil society organizations helping uh, environmental uh, groups uh, um, come online in the early days and we continue to, to work in this area and support uh, the dynamic coalition on community connectivity we call it the DC3 which was founded at the 10th IGF in, in Brazil uh, in 2015 and uh, the community connectivity uh, uh, coalition is really focused on supporting small-scale local networks, which we basically call community networks uh, in the global south generally, but uh, members are from all over the world, and uh, generally working in many areas that have congruence with environmental uh, priorities. I'll just touch very briefly on some of the areas that uh, uh, the members of the Dynamic Coalition are working towards, and I think that many of these areas are fertile ground for future collaboration with the uh, Dynamic Coalition on the Environment. So, for example, some of our members have been developing open hardware wireless routers that are very uh, much easier to repair than the traditional uh, proprietary technologies that are available off the shelf. Uh, one of these is called the Libra Router. Uh, we also have a project to develop a very low-cost open hardware uh, solar panel, uh, char solar battery charger unit that uh, in increases the life of batteries, reducing the, the need for uh, recycling them or at least extending their life so that uh, uh, they don't have to be recycled as often and, and have an impact on the environment there. Um, we're also supporting projects uh, in the area of, of uh, building masks in local communities using uh, local resources such as bamboo. Uh, so we're prototyping designs there to improve the uh, um, carbon footprint from traditional uh, mask materials such as steel. Uh, another area, and this is of particular interest, is many of these uh, small-scale uh, local networks who are members of the DC3 are looking at um, drawing on uh, the emergence of low-cost sensor devices to monitor environmental degradation. So, for example, um, some of the members of the coalition are monitoring uh, water quality and then uh, when it reaches a certain threshold uh, the um, results are tweeted out to the public so that they are aware of the uh, degradation in water quality. Uh, similarly um, in remote rural areas pollution is still a problem say for example from the burning of paddy fields uh, and this pollution is now being detected by some of the members of the coalition and uh, the information can then not only feed into uh, advising uh, parents about whether their children should be walking to school or not, for example, but also to work directly with uh, um, local politicians to provide them with the evidence for policy change and to improve uh, the quality of the air or the local environment in, in the ways in which these many sensor technologies can work. Um, another aspect is the uh, ability of these small-scale networks to support local knowledge and traditional knowledge preservation, uh, which means that people can continue to 
conduct their livelihoods in rural areas and not uh, migrate to the city, for example. So they're just touching on a few areas there that I think uh, uh, we could definitely work uh, with the coalition on supporting some case studies to inform how these small-scale networks and the dynamic coalition uh, can really support uh, environmental priorities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michael Jensen. Uh, for that, I know we're running quite a little bit over time, but I'd like to pass the floor right back to our co-chair, Rainer, uh, to wrap up and take a look at next steps. And before that, I also want to note that our other co-chair, uh, Michael Gia, is also in the Zoom room. But first, uh, from Rainer. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, first of all, I would like to give a big thank you to everybody who contributed to this session. We had very fascinating and interesting talks and they gave a really nice picture and it is really encouraging to see that there's so much interest in the DCE and ideas in which direction we could go. Um, a few points or observations or thoughts which came to me while listening to the talks and the discussion. The first one, the, uh, essentially two approaches to tackling problems. The first one is top down and the second one is bottom up. And I really think, and that's what Mike Jensen just in the last talk highlighted quite nicely. There are many things which have to be tackled bottom up. We have always to keep the communities in mind. We have to include them in our work. We have to include them in coming up with our questions which we want to address. And also at the same time, we have to think globally. This is a really big challenge which has been, which is present in many problems at the moment. Um, to include communities, and particularly when you're thinking about indigenous people, local communities, previously and currently disadvantaged communities, it is really important to have their trust to work with their data when you were using their data. And that is one of the reasons why we've written the care principles, which are standing for collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility and ethics to the data. So it is really the involvement of the communities in the work to consider the communities, the needs and capabilities of the communities and their rights. Um, this is essentially what my thoughts which came up and it is a picture what the DCE should do in the next time is really growing at the moment and I think and I guess that Michael will agree at this session gave many thoughts which need to be now distilled in a coherent picture, how to continue in particular of choosing the main topic for the next year. With this, again, I would like to thank you and just hand over to Michael if he wants to add some points. Thanks. Hi, Rainer. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. I really don't have anything else to add. Apologies for being late, but I just really appreciate the fact that everyone was able to be here. Thank you to our transcriber. Um, and also uh, thank you, a big thank you to both our speakers and to um, Jennifer for stepping in to, um, to moderate. Uh, so thank you all so, so much. That's really it from me. And uh, Jennifer, the, I'll give the floor back to you. Thank you everyone for such a wonderful session. We have overrun, but everything is very interesting. We can talk for much, much longer, but great thank yous to our, our speakers, Reina, Dino, um, YZ, Dr. Gupta, also online from our co-chairs, our rapporteur, uh, Ellen, and our online moderator, Elif, and of course the tech people who, thank you for your indulgence for letting us overrun. Thank you very much, everyone.